Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So innovating in automotive infotainment with Qt Quick. That's basically what I do every day. Uh, and I do that in a company called Palladucor. Uh, and as you can see from our catchphrase, we, we really believe in what, what Qt Quick brings, the, the great design part of it. That, that's one of the key parts in, in the next generation cars, we believe. So who am I? First of all, I like questions. Just raise a hand and I'll point to you and you'll run off with the mic, I guess. <laughs> okay, there's no microphone. Okay, so short questions so I can repeat them. <laughs> uh, I've written a lot about Qt. Uh, that's generally my big contribution. Uh, I wrote Foundations in Qt Development. I don't put the book cover up anymore because it's Qt 4.1, 4.2, so it's kind of outdated. <laughs> Uh, I was a co-founder of the Qt Center Forum and Wiki, uh, a community site, one of the oldest. I worked with Qt for over 10 years, and I've done automotive work for, for, for five years and more. Not all in IVI. I've done powertrain and dependability and the, the really embedded stuff without screens as well. And Pelagicor, who are we? Uh, we were founded in 2009. Uh, and we provide services based on open source for the infotainment industry. Basically because the infotainment is insanely expensive and we believe that the price tag of open source is really attractive. Our customers are OEMs and their suppliers. Uh, in the automotive industry you often speak of tier ones, so the ones delivering to OEMs. And our core competences is that we do know Linux, uh, we do know Qt, and we do know what it takes with automotive hardware. What's the difference? Uh, we're owned by employees and an investment fund called Fourier Transform, uh, a Swedish fund. And we have offices in Sweden and Germany. Uh, many of you know our German friends. Uh, they're part of the, the former Nokia office. We're, we're a part of a bigger ecosystem. So there is a big standardization organization called Genevi, who we work in. We're a member of the system architecture team. We, we work in their baseline integration team to build a reference distro and so on. And we, we contribute a lot there. Then we're a part in, in a couple of alliances building standards for, for distributing media within the car on an uh, electrical and protocol level. Uh, we were one of the first Swedish companies joining Linux Foundation, and we're also contributing to, to Debian and various other places. So, what is this all about, basically? The, it's about selling cars, and how do you sell cars? You, you need to differentiate. Why do somebody buy a BMW? Why do somebody buy a Skoda and so on? You, you need to differentiate the product, but it's pretty standardized. So, so you can play in a number of fields to do that. Reliability, safety, performance, but also beauty and infotainment and comfort and ease of use and all those factors. And then there's a story behind IBI, because back in, I don't know when, the 60s perhaps, a radio was a radio. You could perhaps play tape, but today, it is so much more. You get traffic alerts, you get automatic channel changes or rather frequency changes. You have a number of bands, some of them digital, some of them satellite based. You might want to show metadata for the music being played like right now using an internet service. You might want to do time shift, record traffic alerts and play them back when it's relevant and so on. There, there is much more than goes into these two knobs and five buttons. And there are many solutions to that, and it could look like this. Lots and lots, lots of small buttons enabling all the features. Not very, very well integrated into the car. But we're reaching a point where that's not possible because we want to do so much and you want to be able to drive your car at the same time. So we need to go somewhere, not Volvo perhaps, but somewhere where we redesign the whole thing and really rethink the UI, 
to take advantage of all the technology that we do have. And just from a business perspective, it's, it's funny to see that there's a lot of money going into the infotainment industry. It's constantly growing and there's lots and lots of hardware, but it's so much money, so there's still lots and lots of money for software. And, and from, a, from a Linux perspective, it's even funnier to see because we have almost a hockey stick here, the dark red one, Geneva Linux-based systems being deployed. So, so Linux is taking a bigger part of the pie while the pie is growing. So that is a really positive thing. So what, what do we have to deliver? The, the user is used to this. Perhaps not the N9, but an Android phone. They, they want the full experience of consumer electronics. They want to be able to do what they usually do. They want to use the same services and, and all they're used to. And there is one really big challenge in that, and that's that you're actually driving two tons of moving steel. So it's, that's an engineering challenge, it's a social challenge, but, but you need to address it somehow. There are seats up in the front, if you like. So the big challenge is really saying that a car is not a phone. We have so many factors to take in. We, we have driver workload. Are we crashing right now? We might not want to let the Bluetooth hands-free phone call get through. <laughs> that might be saved for later. Is the information relevant? Again, are we crashing? You might not want to know everything. And is the information complex? Do you have to ask a complex question? Then you really need to pick the time to do that as one. Then you have a whole different range of interaction, interaction surfaces. It's not just a single screen with some multi-touch on it. I'll post the, the slides online if you like later on. So it's <laughs> um, but you have a number of screens. We're, we're seeing screens coming in the in the cluster, the instruments in front of the driver. You have a main screen in the middle. You have a number of knobs that are physical, so you can find them with your hand while driving. You have LEDs, you have head-up displays, you can do audio, you can do voice recognition and, and do speech prompting back to the driver. So there's a lot more to, to play with because you know where the driver is and what he or she is doing right now. So you can really take advantage of this. You, you need to use a number of tricks when presenting information just to address the risks or the challenges that we have in the environment. And this is where Qt comes in really handy because just looking at the list, we might want to use transition just to show that this information is going there so you know where to find it, but you don't have to follow it or search for it on your screens. Qt quick gestures instead of buttons. So you might not want to have to hit something on the screen which isn't where you look when you look at the road, you might just want to gesture over the screen and know that you've changed to nav or whatever, so that you don't have to search for things. Again, cute quick. 3D visualization seems to be one of the trends today. Q3D is there, of course. Uh, we've also worked with a company called Rightware, integrating their CANSI tool chain, which is basically cooler effects prepared for you and and a better tooling. You have a full graphical studio to do things. But you can integrate a Kansi scene into a QML scene and just blend the two tools. So you can do all the 3D in their studio, which is designer friendly. And then you can do the actual engineering using Qt Quick. Another challenge is that you have many applications running at once in the car. You might listening to be listening to media uses the speakers, you try to navigate, uses the speaker. The vehicle status, you, you need to have the TikToks from the indicators or something, uses the speakers. Bluetooth uses the speakers. You get an email that you want to read to the driver, again uses the speakers, and so on. There, there are loads of applications trying to use the same parts of the system. And to handle that, we, we need to have a set of guidelines. So safety first is obvious from the car in the window. So you need to control your applications. 
you can't do a sudden sound. It's not funny to have the scare app looks at the picture and something pops up in the car. That should not be able to happen. <laughs> we need to be careful about moving pictures at the edge of your vision while driving. Uh, and you shouldn't require visual focus away from the road. You should be able to use the basic functionality while driving. That's what you expect. And just the complexity of the information. So, so you need to manage your applications. You need to prioritize them. Who gets to do what right now? What is safe? And so on. They have the speaker problems. We have a set of shared resources. We had main speakers. We might have a single head unit. We have fewer USB ports than we like. We might have one optical drive on three screens. Who gets to watch the movie? So, so we need to, to manage the resources and we need to prioritize. If daddy wants to use the radio, daddy gets to use the radio. But if the kids want to watch a movie, it's OK, as long as daddy does not want to use the radio. So it's, you, you need to have better control of the system. And then you have the whole volatility thing. Uh, and this one is sort of applicable in a phone. It's just that you have more factors to take in. Is that Bluetooth device that you use to stream the audio to still present? Did the person leave with the headset? What's our network coverage? Do we have radio reception? On which band do we have radio reception? Do we have good satellite reception but no FM reception? Which channel should we choose? USB sticks get pulled out while you play from them or indexing. So, so, so we again need to manage the resources. There has to be a mechanism to handle all these factors. So this is one of the things we do. We, we do a resource management framework that handles monitoring of, application, of resources. Are they there or not? We do access control and prioritization. We actually use the same mechanism towards an application. It's the same mechanism if somebody takes the USB sticks and leaves as if another application with high priority gets the USB stick. It simply disappears, and you handle that case in the same way. And we also do aggregation. We're going to look at that later on, but it's merging services to, to enable more task-oriented UIs. And then we have the engineering challenges of IVI. And again, a car is not a phone. You pay maybe 500 euros for a phone, six, 700 if you're really out there. But you will pay at least 20,000 euros, maybe 30, 50 for a car, and you want it to last longer than a year, hopefully. This IR thing needs me to stand further back. But you, you have a set of challenges, legal requirements. We, we need to be on the network within a specific set of milliseconds. It's not enough time to, to start Linux, basically. And we need to be able to, to answer questions over CAN. We might need early video streams. You don't want to wait 30 seconds as you do on a phone, or five seconds on a really quickly booting system when, when putting in the reverse before you can see something. You want early radio or early audio, the TikToks of the indicators if you want to handle them through the IBI system, chimes, radio. And you want stability of the system. Uh, and that's a safety feature. You, you don't want to have to change your focus to reset the IBI system. And the consumer expects a car to work. It, it reflects badly on the whole car if the IVI system keeps hanging. The engine might be solid still, but you don't trust the car. And, and this is the surface that is being shown to, to the driver at all times. Then you have the whole hardware problem. The, the automotive industry uses a different set of temperature ranges and vibration requirements than consumer electronics. So it's a different silicon process to, to get actual automotive grade ships. And compared to, to phone, we usually have many screens. We want to reduce part price so we can drive all rear seat entertainment from a single unit and so on. Connectors are strange. They need to, to take vibration. They need to take heat. They need to take moist. We have heat management. Where do you put your infotainment system, the big PC feeding the driver? You usually put it just next to the engine, between yourself and, and the engine, basically. And that's a hot place without 
very much air. Power management, what do you do where the starter engine runs and you go from 12 volts to 9 volts for a few seconds? You don't want to reboot there. And they have component lifetime, that's kind of interesting. You, you want these things to last 10, 15 years. And just having a USB stick for 10, 15 years, they, they break. So, so you do need wear leveling and, and things like that on a completely different level. So you need to be aware of, of how to treat your hardware to make it last. And they have a whole set of buses. They're all Linux drivers for, for much of this, but you usually need to fiddle around to get it to work for all platforms. Having the CAN bus, the LIN bus, one of the media carrying buses, EAVB, MOST, Flexray. So, so there is a driver issue as well. They have the product development cycle. That one's really funny because you can tell if it's if you meet an automotive engineer or an open source engineer in this job. Because you need to pick the technology maybe five years before the car is deployed. So we think differently. Open source thinks bleeding edge, bleeding edge. The automotive guy might be thinking that this is a long term support distro that's three years old. It's solid. I can use that one as the base. And it's just a place where we need to, to find a good balance in the industry to, to see what's going to be used. But since we're, we're talking <coughs> perhaps three years for a short project and, and a long lifetime of the product after those three development years, so in open source, one of the key factors is just understanding which, problem, which projects will survive. You can't pick a project that's abandoned because then you have to maintain it. So you need to be a part of the ecosystem and really understand, is this being used? Are these people serious? Or is it just a small hobby project that will be ended in six months and then we're stuck with it? Product lifetime, 10 plus years. I think 10 is legal and 15 is often expected. That you need to support this platform. You need to be able to supply spare parts, fix it basically. And during these 10, 15 years, you're always going to be benchmarked to consumer electronics. And just looking at phones five years back, you, you will have a problem being compared to, to the iPad of 2020 for a system that you develop today, no matter what. So, so you need to be smart about what you choose to do and what parts you need to have extendable and what parts you simply skip because you cannot compete. To, to counter many of these factors, that there is a big standardization work going on in the industry. Geneva is only one of the organizations, and we're lurking in many of them. But Geneva is one of the biggest and one of the oldest. And they're working on selecting components and developing and adapting some components. So you can see it as basically Linux standard base, but with automotive eyes on. So you try to pick a set of libraries that are available on all IBI systems. Uh, they also build a reference distro, so you have something to start from. And yeah, the whole Linux environment definition. What, what do we expect from an IVI system? What's required, what's not? Uh, we work in the, the baseline inf integration team, so, so we're one of the few contributors who actually get paid for some work. So we build a distro for them, uh, fulfilling their requirements. We're also part of the system architecture team, so we have a saying in, in the picking of components. And we have the role of community manager. So Jeremiah Foster on the mailing list works for us. Um, right now, we provide a, a compliant distro based on Ubuntu, but we, we've changed that base from Ego to Ubuntu, and we're happy to change it again. But we do have a, a solid platform, a, a compliant distro at all times. So we can build Geneva compatible systems because we feel that's important. So how do we build these systems? I, I've told you about, we, we like it quick. We have a resource framework. We have a base distribution. We have a number of components, be it a proxy for a, for a cloud service or, or be it U-Disks or, or whatever. We also have client applications that aren't graphical. For instance, a, a DLNA server just feeding media content to phones in the car does not have a UI. So we can have a more concrete example here where, where we see we have Blue C, we have a media indexer for, for local files, we have Spotify, 
We have a media player, we have a phone manager for handling hands-free calls, streaming audio to and from the hands-free. We have a DLNA server. Uh, what we do in this system is we, we monitor the availability of, of different media. It's the CD in, it's the USB in, and so on. We also monitor the availability of Spotify and keeps us logged in as soon as we have network and so on. We, we do access control. So you have the phone application competing with the media player. Let's see if I can go back. I can. So, so we manage who gets the speakers and how do we make the transition. Do we pause the audio? Do we simply fade it? All those rules. Uh, and then we have aggregation. So we provide a single search API and playback API, regardless of the back end. Uh, Spotify is a funny case here because they have user interface requirements in their terms of service. So there are still requirements on the OEM deploying the system that you have to s support a feature set. And we only provide an API that makes it possible to do that. So, so we shift some of the responsibility upwards just because we don't want to impose, impose a design paradigm on the UI. We want complete freedom for the automotive makers. And this reflects very well into, into QML. So, so we have a set of databases for, for various resources. This is just the media example to, to show you small snippets of code. I don't have time to show a full application. But basically what we do is we, we have a media search model where you can specify a filter as a string. I want songs starting with Brian. And you get all the Brian's singing. And you can use the list view. So we, we only do the back end. And the funny thing with, with Qt Quick is that it, it doesn't only do the graphical things. That, that's easy, just providing the right models. It, it's, that's the easy part of the problem. But we can also handle things like the audio zone. So you can create an audio zone object and say, I want the main speakers. And you try to get those. And then we have a property for all our rights management resources, so to speak, called available. So you can say, if the... If the speakers are not available, we remember what playing state we had, and we pause. And then when it becomes available, we simply resume what we did. And the beautiful thing is QML is perfect for this as well. It does not have to be only the UI. You can do part of the, the state management up in, in QML. Not said that you should do everything, because QML is hard to verify from a safety critical standpoint. You also need a formal state machine somewhere that you have full control of. And it's dead simple to implement as well. You, you simply inherit Q objects instead of Q quick item or abstract item model. And as I, as I showed you, it, it fits very well, well into our paradigm of just managed resources. There is a good way to express that. What, what you basically do here with audio zone is that you say, I expect there to be an audio zone. And then you wait for it to be filled. So it's more of a, a proxy object, so to speak. But what we see when working with Qt Quick together with OEMs and Tier 1s and, and doing example UIs, R&D projects, and so on, is that this is a very designer-friendly tool. It works the way they think. I, I usually present QML to designers as HTML without the legacy of handling page text flowing on pages. And they get it quite quickly. And, and what it also gives them is quick feedback cycles. So you can actually be agile and try your UI. I, I've seen cases where, where you do a paper spec of a UI, send it off to your supplier, you wait six weeks until you get something you can try, and you do that for a couple of years, and it never turns out great. Here you have a turnaround cycle of two, three minutes. You can just test your IDs as a designer to get the UI feel right. It also helps us because it, it clearly separates the UX from back ends. I was speaking to you earlier. It's QML is a tool that forces you to make that split that everybody at school told you to do. It's not like Visual Basic when you double click the OK button and oh, you put the logic in the UI. Sorry. <laughs> so it's, it's a really nice tool from that standpoint that you do things correctly. But it's also nice for us delivering the middleware, because this is a very clear interface for us. As a, pro as a supplier, we cannot do the UI because the UI is not generic. It's specific to each and every OEM. 
but this gives us a clear layer. We work up to here, and the rest is something we'd like to help you with, but your responsibility. And having that, that API, it is also very easy to build a trivial simulator backend. So we can make it possible to run the same QML code that you do on the actual system. On a PC, you, you can demonstrate it. You can run it on, a, on an Android tablet or, or whatever. So you can show it around in the design department. You can send it to your manager and you can watch it in a viewer. So it's, it's a really good tool just for, for sharing the design that you've done in QML. And what have we done? We, we've built a number of demonstrators, valuation platforms. We work with both OEMs and tier ones. Uh, we help some OEMs with, with their R&D in user interface, just providing these quick feedback cycles, letting them try new ideas for the future. And we've been working with this on multiple hardware platforms. So it's both Intel and ARM and, and most of the ARM providers that are interested in the IVI space. We have Qt Quick up and running or have had it during different projects. There is a, the top screenshot there. You can watch it downstairs. But the, the big setup is down at Electronica. So anybody going to Munich tonight could perhaps sneak in and see a full car set up with an RSE system built by us, together with a company called MTA. But we have a small developer set up down there, so you can get the feel of it. But we really believe that Qt Quick provides this clean interface that we need between designer and engineers. And designers like it, and engineers like it, because it's it's clean and well-defined. And we've also found that we can, we can use a single API, this API layer, regardless of how you build your UI. If you're extremely application-focused, you only want to do USB streaming in one place and Spotify streaming in one place and video playback in another place. Or if you're just fussy and task-focused, you say, I want media. Give me any media. If I click the media, start playing it. We, we can do that through a single UI. Uh, and that's really great because it's a single API for us to, to entertain as well. And Qt Quick really enables agile testing of IDs on a whole different level that I've never seen it in IVI before. So, so we really believe that Qt Quick is the way forward for building really rich next generation IVI systems. So thank you for attending. Very nice. Thanks.